is this is a fully women run initiative to show you what talent exists all around us and what jobs are out here for you right in your own communities. Uh, this project wouldn't be possible without our great funders and partners, Center for Ocean Ventures and Entrepreneurship, COVE of course, the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development of Nova Scotia, IGNITE, Dalhousie University's Amera Idea Hub and DeepSense with additional support from IBM Canada and Engineers Nova Scotia. My name is Kia Jade Bonner. I am the Industry Project Manager at IGNITE and I'm joined by Tristan Mavey, uh, who's our Youth Program Coordinator at IGNITE. And we're gonna be running your speaker series today. And you'll also see us on Saturday as well. We'll be, uh, we'll be there as well. <laughs> uh, for our session today, we're gonna to be joined by Melanie Nadeau. She is the CEO of COVE um, and Jessica Douglas, an ocean technologist from Fundy Force. Just a few housekeeping items before we uh, let Melanie go ahead. Um, after each presentation, we're gonna have about 10 minutes for a Q&A period. Um, we ask that you ask your questions through chat and we can moderate anonymously. This way, when we put it on YouTube, uh, your, your picture and your name won't be publicized, of course. Um, and we ask that everyone stays on mute during the presentations, if you don't mind. Um, without further ado, Melanie, take it away. Great. Well, thank you, Kia Jade, for the uh, introduction and for getting us started. And thank you to everyone who's joining the session. It's very exciting to see some of you, some I can't see, but um, this is such a great opportunity for ourselves um, to be able to get the to talk to you. But really, this session is about you. Um, this program is about you. And it's about you. Um, uh, learning about uh, opportunities in the ocean industry, about uh, meeting mentors and women that can help navigate the questions that you have. And our hope is that you consider as you progress your, your school and your, your um, career asp aspirations that you at least consider uh, a career in this space. And as you'll see, there's many different opportunities throughout these sessions that you're probably getting exposed to around um, careers in the ocean tech space uh, and tech just in general. So I'm um, very excited to be here and I do have a presentation so I will um, try to upload that and my thought today was really to give you a more of a shorter presentation on what COVE is and to give you a sense of what we do here and uh, move into offshore energy and more broadly around offshore energy. And I will probably close up with just some thoughts on, um, you know, I know there may be questions on there on how I got involved in this, um, how was my background and so on. So I'm happy to share that as well. And uh, questions at the end, but also if you're using chat, I'm happy to answer questions throughout and make it more interactive. So I am going to share my screen here and there it is, perfect. Um, so this isn't too long, um, but uh, we've, um, some of that isn't showing there in our logo, uh, but we've, um, you know, been very excited about this program at COVE, the Center for Ocean Ventures and Entrepreneurship. We have a workforce development program with several initiatives. And, um, you know, as part of that, we work with youth and different groups uh, throughout uh, different ages, if you will, um, to focus them and identify opportunities, whether it's career opportunities or programming opportunities for people to be more engaged in the sector. And we need people like you to take an interest in this sector and think about some of the career opportunities because there's real demand for, for talent, for creative people, for people with different ideas and having good representation. So we're very excited to be part of this program. Um, our so Cove, uh, we're located here in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Um, we have a national mandate and part of our mandate is to look at different sectors within um, the ocean, uh, the ocean with different industries, if you will, within the ocean sector 
And so that includes, uh, you know, energy, which will be, you know, the focus for today, but marine transportation, marine tourism, fisheries and aquaculture, marine defense and security. And our um, key um, feature within Cove is that we're, uh, we have onshore, an onshore facility here, and we have also access to offshore um, right here on the waterfront downtown. And we bring a lot of different organizations, so businesses, different research institutes, and collaborate on different projects to really kind of advance ocean technology which in, within those various streams. And we have things like machine workshops, uh, co-working space, and program as I, programming, as I said, and uh, also lots of talent that we work with. So whether it's programs like these or we run internship programs, um, that's the kind of people that uh, we work with to try to engage in this sector. Um, the uniqueness about our space and, and what's neat about where we are, we're really downtown, but we have such a cluster of different organizations that are in the ocean tech industry or a facet of it. So you can think of if ever you're looking at a career within industry, uh, partners like shipbuilding, offshore petroleum, aquaculture, marine transportation are all within this cluster here in Nova Scotia. There's great academic institutes institutes like DAL, of course, and they have very specific programming around oceans. There's a community college that we work with very closely, and they have multiple programs as well around um, careers in the ocean space. And then um, the other unique facet is that there's a very strong government focus in the area around oceans. So things like institutes like the Bedford Institution of Oceanography with DFO does tremendous amount of work. Um, anything from looking at different species or regulatory aspects and so on. And I'm sure you'll hear more about it, that um, when you hear about the title project. But it's just to give you a sense of all the different organizations that are out there that are located within a very close proximity that are doing tremendous amounts of work, uh, whether it's commercial or research in the ocean space. Um, that's just sort of a visual representation of where we are. And Cove, you know, we work with um, with all those different organizations that I showed beforehand, but we're also quite well situated in that we work with our partners um, to the south of the border, so very closely with New England, uh, as well with partners over in Europe. And, uh, you know, we tend to work with like-minded organizations or companies that are interested in coming here and so on. So we have very strong partnerships in all areas outside of just regionally here um, in other countries and also across Canada. Um, this is what our site looks like. So I, I mentioned to you, we have co-working space, we have a facility, um, we have wharf side, so a lot of vessels that are there. If ever you came here, we have um, autonomous vehicles. If they, Again, if you came on site, you'd be able to see some of those depending on what's happening. And so it's generally a very active facility and a very active wharf. Um, this is, you know, all the partners and companies that we work with directly, directly in different facets, some of our clients, some of our partners that help us deliver on programs and whatnot. So it's quite a wide array of different organizations. And these are a lot of the success stories, and I won't go through any of them in, in detail, but just to give you a flavor of some of the work that happens, very international in nature. Um, you know, we have a company that works here called Kraken Robotics, and they're doing lots of really interesting work in uh, underwater vehicles and different applications there, working with the defense industry and doing a lot of innovative work, um, and so on. So the list continues. So a lot of these are examples of the companies that we work with and Cove always has tended to have a role in uh, most of these type of projects or these organizations, whether it's through programming or the very fact that um, we build a lot of relationships as well. Uh, so that's really it. That was my little highlight of Cove, just to give you a sense of everything that we're about. And uh, then I was going to talk about offshore renewable energy. So um, you know, I was hoping that we could make this more interactive, but it's always hard in a virtual way. Uh, my question, my first question here was, I wonder, and maybe somebody could put it in the chat, if you know where, um, where does energy from the ocean come from? Anyone want to try in the chat? 
I'm not hearing anything. Or if you take off your mic, tides, waves, tidal energy. Great. Well, more tides. So a lot of people are familiar, it looks like, from um, the tidal projects that we have here. So you'll, you'll hear more about that after me. But you're absolutely right. Um, if my slide works here. Oh, and there we go. Um, so there's different forms of uh, energy that comes from the oceans. And I've listed here some of the more common type um, areas where energy comes from. So you have ocean waves. You don't see much of that on the East Coast, um, but there is a lot of ocean uh, wave energy on the West, potential on the West Coast. And that's largely due to the, the wave regime and um, the environment that they have there. But uh, lots of technologies are focused on extracting, en extracting energy from, from waves. Um, there's offshore wind as well. So you may have seen these kind of um, offshore wind turbines. Again, there's none on the East Coast, but there are some if you go to the UK or um, there's a lot of work happening in, uh, in the US at the moment in the Northeast US along the Eastern Seaboard, focusing on offshore wind development. And um, many companies that we work with here are also involved in parts of that supply chain down to the south of the border. And you talked to the middle picture there is looking at tidal and obviously the tidal ranges uh, produce currents and that provides opportunities for um, turbines to generate uh, energy. And there are other things that maybe are more, you know, I could have added quite a few more different options. Those would be the most commonplace, but there are other things that are surfacing when you think about innovation and what's happening in a, perhaps a more global context, but things like floating solar farms are appearing in certain parts of the world and other things like using ocean currents, which is just part of the, um, um, the uh, ocean current streams that are formed down around Florida, say, and whatnot, that there are different types of technologies that are used there to capture the energy from those. So those are more peripheral types of, of ways to capture um, energy from the oceans, but something that, um, you know, is important and um, creates opportunities. And there's a lot of innovation happening around those, uh, those um, different sources of, of energy as well. And, and so for here in Canada, primarily a lot of the focus in offshore marine renewable energy has been in wave energy, as I talked about on the West Coast, um, some tidal as well on the West Coast, offshore wind, so offshore wind um, where it makes sense on both coasts and even in the, um, the Great Lakes, for example, there's interest there in offshore wind and then tidal current energy, which um, the, um, the next speaker will be able to talk about in, in more detail. And of course, um, Nova Scotia, a great area um, for tidal energy. And what I you know, wanted to show with this slide, there's obviously a lot of work that happened, that's been happening over um, you know, decade plus within Nova Scotia to, to capture the energy from the tides. But I really wanted here just to show all the things that go in. So I talk about technology, but there's so many different considerations when you're looking at building offshore projects like this, like what's the legislation that needs to be in place? What are the environmental environmental assessments, what type of data needs to be collected, how do you meet the regulations, um, what is the type of research, whether it's, it's, it's environmental research or technology research that's required to be able to make those type of projects happen, what's required in the supply chain. So how do you operate these, uh, these type of power plants essentially offshore, what's required for that over long periods of time, how do you do um, environmental monitoring, for example, over periods of time, uh, how do you retrieve these types of devices or do maintenance offshore, all types of things that you think about in terms of supply chain support and, and again, different companies that are engaged or involved in that. And then there are test centers, of course, that help to enable a lot of these technologies to, to happen because um, working in the offshore energy space is always a challenge. And so, you know, it's, um, it's useful to be able to test either operations or technologies in a very controlled way. And so test centers offer a really valuable, um, are really valuable for that. So that just kind of gives you a flavor of the full scope, even when we're just drilling down into one specific area 
um, uh, in the offshore marine renewable space. And then here is more lastly, I wanted to kind of just close off here and just to inspire you a little bit when uh, I um, just did a little, um, you know, scan and, and happy to see a lot of females in these pictures. And these are all real, real people. And I have to actually acknowledge Elisa Oberman from Marine Renewables Canada. Um, she runs the National Association for Marine Renewables, and she was very generous in giving me a lot of pictures and whatnot for this deck. Um, and she's also, um, you know, a, a great, strong female who's running an organization like that and very much promoting um, the development of offshore renewable energy. Uh, but yeah, I just here, I just wanted to give you a sense of some of the types of career paths you could be thinking of. And I, I did sort of drill in a little bit to the STEM space, but when I think about whether it's offshore wind project development or um, tidal energy development or even wave energy development and what's required there, there's so many different skill sets required, but these are just examples that I jotted down here like that are skills or career opportunities that um, I see very applicable to any of these types of projects. And anything from being a mathematician and looking at um, the predictability of different um, resources, so whether it's the tidal currents or offshore wind and the modeling that goes into that to understand what type of wind regimes, for example, will produce a certain amount of energy output. So that's, you know, a lot of skill set required there. Naval architect, as you can imagine, is another example of a career path that um, you see in a lot of these industries or anything really offshore, looking at designing, building, anything in the ocean environment. Um, because you know, there's a lot of work in the ocean environment. Again, there's regulatory work. And sometimes, you know, you can come from a, a STEM background because you understand the technical side, but go into a regulatory space. And so you oftentimes see that type of transition in people's careers. Um, environmental scientists, engineer, materials technician, ocean data analysts. And, and you know, ocean data is um, becoming really, really important in how we understand the oceans, whether it's from the production of energy in this context, or the environmental impacts or climate change or um, how vehicles are operated in, um, in uh, the ocean environment. So data is, is tremendously uh, important and becoming more and more so. So anyways, it just gives you a bit of a flavor of, of, um, of the type of opportunities that could exist for you if, if uh, you decide to pursue a path, a career path in this way. And a couple of things about us, you know, there's ways for you to get engaged. And I know all the groups like the Amira Idea Hub and Ignite Labs all have different activity or conferences or events as well. Um, from our end, we have um, a good uh, session coming up in June where we partner with the H2O conference, which is a fairly big conference. And we do demo days. And uh, with that, we're, this year we'll be doing it virtually, but you'll be able to see in action a lot of different technology. And so if you have interest in that, it's something that you may want to stay tuned um, to. And there are other conferences as well that we participate in. So um, you can always follow us on any social channel stream, of course, and if you want to hear more. And uh, that's it for me. So I'm happy to entertain some questions. And I did say that I would talk a little bit about my background, um, if there's interest, because I do. Um, so I had a little bit of, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. There we go. Um, I, uh, so I myself am an engineer. Um, I went to a school in Ontario called University of Waterloo and did environmental engineering uh, several years ago and um, have since done many different things, anything from, you know, being very involved in the technical space when I, you know, started my career to moving on to doing more management, more business stuff. And uh, now I sort of work in a combination of all that. 
And, and so that's kind of been a lot of my career progression over the last, uh, you know, 15, 20 years um, since my graduation. But I did take, you know, quite a route to get there. I actually started in the, um, in the Navy, was very interested in, in exploring and, and um, seeing what opportunities lie there. Um, did that, went to college, did some science work, got very interested in the science side and had a natural knack for that. And eventually that evolved into me um, leaving the Navy and going into engineering and, and kind of developing my career from there. So with that, I will um, pause and maybe just take some questions. Awesome, thanks so much, Melanie. That was really great presentation. Um, did you guys have any questions for Melanie? Um, maybe anything at all? If you can't think of any right now, um, I know whenever I listen to presentations, I always think of them like kind of halfway through or something. Um, you, you can always like drop it in the chat as well. And then after Jesse's presentation, we can... Oh, we have a question. Um, what was your experience studying engineering at Waterloo? That's a big question. Um, so the program at Waterloo, uh, oh, well, maybe I should start. I was a more of a, if you will, a little bit more of a mature student when I went to Waterloo. So I had been working for a few years and had the college degree. And uh, so that was interesting starting, you know, uh, as a more mature student when a lot of my classmates were, um, were a little bit younger than me. But that sort of about, over time, that didn't really, um, make too much of a difference and that program at Waterloo is a five-year program and it is um, uh, intensely involves co-op and there are six if I recall correctly six different co-op streams that you have to do and so you're you know and you got to find your job so it's it was a little bit intense because you're either studying or trying to do an interview and get land your next job and and so on but what I would say after the five years it was such a good um experience and you know every year was different the first year in engineering was really tough and i think anyone who's gone through first year engineering has found it pretty tough um but you know it gets better and better and um when you get more into the applied stuff it gets even more interesting because then you kind of align with some of your interests it's not just kind of the general engineering and then you make friends along the way which always makes things a lot better and you just understand how to do assignments and work in teams there's a lot of teamwork involved in engineering and uh anyway so i would say overall it was it was uh, a very um good experience um it set me up really well for um a career path and you know one of the reasons why i went into engineering was uh i had been good at sciences um i had a natural interest in physics chemistries and maths and and that and so um i also was looking for an opportunity to get a job when i graduated and so i thought if i get an engineering degree i'm i'm likely to get a job when i graduate so that was very important to me and um the other thing i went into environmental engineering when it wasn't really a thing um in the 90s and um you know people would ask me, why are you doing environmental engineering? You'll never get a job. So it's quite interesting now that there's so much focus on sustainability and, and um, climate change and environmental, um, you know, aspects of, of, of everything, really. And, uh, and anyway, so for me, it was also about, you know, how can I contribute as well to society in a way that uses my skills? And that was a lot of why, you know, and I was interested in the environment at the time. And uh, that's why I went into that program specifically. But now that program is, I think, more widely ap applied across many different universities. Awesome. That was super informative. <laughs> um, we have another question, too. Um, uh, they're thinking about joining the military before they go to school. Um, what was your experience like and would you recommend it? Well, I won't answer the second question, but I'll talk about my experience and why I did it. Um, so I'm originally from Quebec, from Northern Quebec, um, from a very, very small town up North. 
And for me, when my decision to join the military was largely around um, the opportunity to, to leave Northern Quebec, to get experience, to travel. And I was, I was young, I was, you know, 17 uh, when I left. And uh, it was to get that experience, to get a job right from the beginning. And uh, I spent four and a half years there in the, in the Navy. And it was, you know, a tremendous experience because I traveled so much. I did a lot of training and the military is great for training. Um, you know, I moved up some ranks. I did a lot of sea time. I got to understand what it's like to be in the open ocean and to stay at sail in different storms. So I have a lot of respect for the oceans, uh, for the ocean. And, um, you know, and it was a great time because again, I was young and you meet a lot of different people and, and wherever you go. So, you know, I don't know if you were thinking of the Navy or the army, but wherever you go and wherever they put you, whether you're on coast or you're at different bases, you have an instant family. And so that was really a nice aspect to it. Now it's not easy. Um, it's a whole different world to be in the military. Uh, basic training was, I can, you know, I don't want to dissuade you, but I wouldn't call it fun. It was an experience. It was hard, <laughs> but it's a short experience, right? So um, it's a short period. And then, you know, for, for longer term gains. So um, it depends why you're thinking about going into the military. It was a great experience for me, but I also realized at a point in time that, um, you know, I had done a lot of traveling with the military, a lot of trailing, uh, training, had been at sea, and it was a point in time where I didn't see it as my long-term career path, and so I had decided to get out, and that's when I decided to go into engineering and wanted to do something different, so that's, you know, that was sort of my pivot point after having been in and gotten so much experience, it was time to move on to something, something else, but, you know, in terms of you know, who I am and how disciplined I can be. I am sure that there was a lot of early influence from the days when I was in the military and a lot of the learnings that I gained there that helped me through engineering school that would have helped me in a lot of the jobs that I've had and so on. So, um, you know, it, it, like I said, it really depends what I recommended. I think it depends why you're thinking about it. Awesome. Uh, we have one more question. Um, so they're a mature student. Um, so what sort of disadvantages and disadvantages did you face, um, I guess, being in Waterloo as a mature student? Like I said, the first year was probably the toughest um, starting um, because uh, I had a lot of lived experience, if you will, and had a, you know, had a job and everything. And then I went into um, a school, Southern Ontario, I wasn't from Southern Ontario, and so didn't have the connections there and was really going there for school. And a lot of my classmates were first out of their homes, um, had an experience. So I didn't live in res because I could not imagine myself living in res <laughs> as a mature student. So I had a little bit of a different experience, definitely in year one. And, you know, I wasn't necessarily, if you will, I was quite there for school, not necessarily for the other aspects that come in, because I had lived a lot of that before. Um, I'd been away from home from several years. So it wasn't something that, you know, I was super excited to go to university for. But that was the first year and that was probably maybe the, the hardest adjustment. But then as time goes on and you know, you're know you so absorbed in your work and your schoolwork and you're building your teams and your friends and who you align with and that, those, the age gap or the differences became unnoticeable over time because we're all going through these same things at the same point in time. So, you know, um, the first year was probably the most challenging in that early adjustment, but over time, I, you know, being um, a little bit old or really didn't make that much of a difference uh, at all. I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have noticed it that much. And then I the other thing that I would say, you know, when I, um, it did help me in ways. So as I said, uh, Waterloo was co-op driven. And um, it definitely helped, I'm sure, to have the experience that I had had when I was going into a co-op. So, you know, I'd land on site to a company and I'd be ready to go. 
Um, so we didn't have huge training requirements necessarily. So I got great experience with co-ops and I was um, allowed to do so many different things, which was so great. But I probably attributed that to, in some respect to the experience, the working experience that I probably had before. And so that would have been really valuable. And so my gain through that was getting even more experience as I was working through my co-ops and getting more responsibilities just because um, I had been used to a lot of responsibility before. Awesome. That was a really great question and answer. Um, if you guys think of any more questions for Melanie, um, you can just save them for, we can come back to them after Jesse's presentation. Uh, but we want to make sure that we leave enough time for Jesse and her slides. Uh, so yeah, thanks, Melanie. And thank you. If you're ready, go right ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, I definitely want to start out just by saying um, thank you for having me. I just after watching Melanie's presentation and, and the, the past presentations from YouTube, I feel so lucky to even be remotely associated with these amazing women. So thank you so much again. And I'm just going to try to, how do I share my screen again? There we go. Okay, you're going to see yourself for a second. Oh, okay. I guess we're starting on the first slide because... I'm not great. <laughs> um, okay, so I guess I'll just, yeah, I'll just give a little bit about my background, kind of doing the opposite of what Melanie did. Um, so I started my post-secondary education doing the environmental engineering technology program at NSCC. Um, I always knew I wanted to do something related to the environment because it's something I care a lot about and I'm very passionate about. Um, so that program, also, I'm really sorry if I talk fast. I am a fast talker. I got to try to keep it in check. <laughs> um, and also, if you think of any questions, questions while I'm doing the presentation, feel free to drop them in chat early and I can answer them at the end. Um, I just know that when I'm doing, when I'm looking at a presentation, it's usually questions that I think of in the middle and then I forget them at the end when they ask for questions. So I um, just wanted to put that out there. But yeah, so the Environmental Engineering Technology Program really focused a lot on um, freshwater resources and um, groundwater and soil remediation, environmental site assessments and that kind of thing. Um, so while I was doing my second year of that program, I found out about the Oceans Technology Advanced Diploma Program that was new to NSCC. Um, that program came, I, th I think it was from industry demand that that program came to be, um, and it was very new. And there was already a, a pretty big wait list for the program. Um, so a couple, me and a couple others from my class had put our names down on the wait list, and I was kind of thinking, oh, maybe um, in a couple years when I got off the wait list, if I, if I don't have a job or if I don't like what I'm doing, it's kind of a, I can, I can slide in there and, and do that. Um, but I ended up getting a surprise call. Um, I just graduated from the environmental engineering technology program. I think I'd been looking for a job very low key for like a month. And then I got a call, um, I think it was like a week or two before the program was going to start that a seat had opened up and they asked if I wanted to do the program. And I decided to do it. Um, so the Oceans Technology Program really um, kind of called to me because of the four-month internship that comes along with it. So I was really eager to get work experience and hands-on experience. So it's really great that that's a part of the program. Um, and another cool part of that program is that people from all different backgrounds do it. So it, since it's an advanced diploma, you need to have either a, a relevant diploma or a relevant degree um, to apply for it. So it was really cool. It ended up being a, a, an interesting group of people where it's like mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, um, marine biologists, and um, just all kinds of different backgrounds come into the program. And it, it's really cool how ocean technology is a, is a it's an interesting field where there's just so many different people, like no matter what your skill set is, there's there's a place for you. Um, so I did that, and uh, my capstone project for that uh, program was working on a renewable energy solution to try to recharge instrumentation, uh, like research instrumentation at sea. Um, and actually, if uh, if anyone remembers Jenny Chorus's presentation um, from I think it was a couple weeks ago, she was actually one of my project partners on that. Um, so she's such a sweetheart, I love her. Um, and so we did that project together and. And with, uh, with Mo, our other partner, and uh, NSCC does this awesome thing at the end of every year where um, students are able to showcase their senior projects. It's called the Tech Showcase. 
and different members of industry are invited to come kind of walk around and see everyone's different projects. It's a great networking opportunity. So we were showcasing our project and uh, Tony Wright, who is the general manager of Force, but I didn't, I didn't know he was the general manager at the time. Um, he came up to our uh, booth and I was talking to him about our project and he asked me if I had an internship yet. And I said, no, and please give me a job because um, it just said Tony Force. So I was just like, oh, at Force is a cool place to work. Um, and then the rest is history. So I was lucky enough to get an internship at the, well, I'm just going to say the full name and then I'll say the acronym from now on. It's uh, the Fundy Ocean Research Center for Energy, which is quite a mouthful. So I will be saying FORCE for the rest of the presentation. Um, and FORCE loves acronyms. So you're probably going to hear quite a few more of those. But um, yeah, so I started out doing, um, I was at their visitor center in Pyersboro, Nova Scotia. And so that is kind of a research facility base, operations base, but it's also a spot that is open to the public in the summer months. So people can come and learn about tidal energy, learn about the Bay of Fundy and that kind of thing. So I was there giving tours for and living in Pyersboro for the summer and um, also participating in marine operations when they would come up. Um, so then at the end of my internship, I was lucky enough to get offered a full-time position as an ocean technologist at FORCE. Um, and I've been there for, uh, I think over two and a half years, almost, almost it'll be three years in May. Um, and then this past year, I just got my certified engineering technologist uh, status in the environmental discipline um, because I got enough work experience for that. So I was really proud of that. Um, so I will just talk a little bit more about uh, FORCE just to give more context to what I do as a job and tidal energy in general. Um, so FORCE is Canada's leading research facility for tidal stream technology and FORCE was created to better understand if this technology can play a safe effective role in Canada's energy future. So FORCE is basically it's a nonprofit, um, it's a host and a steward. So we have a crown lease area in the Minas Passage where we are able to facilitate the demonstration of in-stream tidal, tidal turbines. So FORCE provides onshore and offshore infrastructure to developers. So that's, uh, we've got a substation and subsea cables laid. So developers are able to come in and test their turbines at the site and connect directly to the grid that way. And then we also have the visitor center as another onshore um, piece of infrastructure, which also kind of um, serves as a research base of operations. Um, and FORCE is a really cool interdisciplinary team, mostly science-based, but everyone has a different background. There's, I don't think there's any single person at FORCE that has the same background as someone else, um, educational or life experience. Um, all of our skill sets are different, um, which is just, I feel like the ocean industry is pretty much always like that. Um, and we're very focused on environmental monitoring and research, um, which is what I do a lot. So, and then I'll just talk a little bit more about the Minas Passage because I know probably most of you know, but um, just in case you don't, the Minas Passage is basically the Mount Everest of tides. So they have the highest tides in the world and the coastline is pinched. Actually, I'll just go to the next slide. Um, you can see here uh, where the force dot is. This is a picture of the Bay of Fundy, so if it's a little pixelated. Um, and you can see where that arrow is, that's the Minas Passage. So the water flow gets pinched in that area and that's why we get very, very fast tidal speeds there, um, which is, there's actually enough energy potential in the Minas Passage alone to power over 2 million homes, which is not something we're trying to get close to. Um, FORCE is trying to understand how much energy can be extracted safely and without any adverse effects to the marine ecosystem. So, tidal stream technology. Um, it's funny, this picture on the left, I just, it's just a clip art of a windmill um, because tidal stream technology is basically like an underwater windmill. Um, but what's really cool and I think what's great opportunity for anyone new to the industry um, is that when you think of a windmill, you know exactly what that looks like, that people have already figured out what a windmill is, what's the best design for it, kind of what the shape is. Um, and that doesn't exist yet for tidal. It's, it's a very new technology. We don't know yet if it's going to be best to put something on the seafloor, if it's best to have a, a floating array of turbines, if it's best to have one big turbine or many small ones. Um, so it's a very new industry and that means we need a lot of, you know, creative ideas from people and, and you know, it's, it's a really, really cool industry and all the different developers have completely different ideas on what they think is going to be the best design to harness the power of the tides. Um, and it's, it's a lot different than dams or barrages in that they're, you know, scalable and removable. 
um, what could be really interesting about tidal energy and why it could be a really important part of Nova Scotia's energy future is the fact that the tides are so predictable and reliable. We can predict the tides for years and years to come. Um, so it could be a really important part of Nova Scotia's energy future. We're so lucky to have the Minus Passage in the Bay of Fundy. Um, electricity is actually the number one source of greenhouse gas emissions in Nova Scotia. So if that's something that could help us get off greenhouse gas emissions, that could be you know, really important. Um, so what I do specifically is a lot of um, research and environmental monitoring, personally focused on um, marine mammals and fish mostly, um, but FORCE's Environmental Effects Monitoring Program, EEMP is the acronym, um, focuses on, like I said, marine mammals, fish, but also seabirds, lobster, and marine noise. Um, so for most of my job, I do a lot of deploying and recovering um, instruments into the ground lease area and also planning those types of operations and helping plan those studies and um, as well as dealing with the data um, once we recover the instruments. And I do a little bit of engagement and outreach as well. So this is just a little picture of me at a conference. And yeah, so I do like conferences, workshops, presentations like this, and I still do tours at the visitor center um, in Parsboro as well, which is so awesome. And we actually have a tour planned for the next Ocean Tech class to come soon, and I'll be giving that tour to them. Um, so now I'll talk a little bit about the marine mammal research that I work on. Um, so one of FORCE's main uh, marine mammal um, parts is deploying these sea pods, which so you can see in the picture on the right, that's me and my coworkers and um, Mike and his crew. Um, so that big yellow thing is a subs package. And then in the, can you see my cursor? Um, this is the sea pod. So this is an instrument made by Chelonia in the UK, um, and it listens for uh, echolocation clicks. So we're specifically um, listening for harbor porpoise at our site. We don't really get any larger marine mammals, but um, they make echolocation clicks when they're uh, foraging for food, communicating and that kind of thing. So um, the sea pods listen for those, and we're able to see you know, when we see the most harbor porpoises, um, like seasonal variations and where they are, we deploy. Um, I'll go to the next slide, actually. We deploy five different sea pods in different locations at our site. Um, so that's kind of a picture of all of them together on the deck. So I work on those um, recoveries and deployments and the, we put those in for like three months at a time and then we'll pick them back up. Um, I'll change the batteries, take the data off and then put them back in. Um, and you can also see in this picture, I really hope you can see my cursor. Um, these things right here, the black things are um, fish tag receivers. So these ones, um, we work with uh, the Ocean Tracking Network, OTN, um, at DAL, and we work at, with Acadia um, for these. So they own these and we put them on our sea pods so they're able to detect um, any tagged fish that swim by as well. Um, and then another cool project that I worked on um, for marine mammals, and this is kind of um, interesting for our site, is because uh, we are at the Mount Everest of tides and we have such fast water. Um, pretty much no ocean instrument was built for our environment. So a lot of projects that we do are kind of testing different oceanographic instruments against each other and just in different tidal flow conditions to validate the data we collect and also see how well they um, are able to work in different tidal conditions. Um, because most of them, like most of the ocean, is pretty much like our site at slack water, which is only 20 minutes every six or so hours. Um, so for most of the time that they're in our site, they're completely being sandblasted and with water and sand. And it's really rough on the instruments. We really put them to the test. Um, so for this project, we were comparing different passive acoustic monitoring devices against each other. Um, so a lot of these were actually from local companies, which is another great thing about um, the ocean tech industry in Nova Scotia has just so many opportunities. Like if it's in tidal, if it's in, um, sales, you know, for a lot of these instruments. So we were comparing the JASCO AMR, which JASCO is a company here, and against the um, Oceansonics IC Listen. Um, the Oceansonics is in Truro, and then we were also comparing them against the C-Pod and the F-Pod that I mentioned earlier, and uh, the Ocean Instruments Soundtrap. So on the left-hand side, it's a very blurry picture of me at the Aquatron at Dow, testing them out in the pool setting, and then on the right-hand side is the actual platform with all the instruments mounted. Kind of looks like a mess. There's a lot going on there. Um, and we put that down um, the way that it looks in the, in the picture on the right hand side. 
Um, and actually those buoys at the back, those big orange ones, um, that's how we recover the platform. So there's an acoustic release attached to that. So we put a transducer in the water that sends pings down to the acoustic release and that um, tells it to come up to the surface when we're ready to recover it. So that's another kind of cool thing. Um, so also I do a lot of work with fish. Um, I mentioned earlier on the sea pods, we have those fish tag receivers. So we're currently working on a project, um, working with MCG to tag more fish and, and work with tags that are already existing. Um, and we're going to be doing a range test with uh, the receivers to see how they behave and how, um, how they uh, collect data in different flow conditions at our site and how far away they can um, uh, receive each other's signals. Um, so the specific species of fish we're looking at here are Atlantic salmon, striped bass, white shark, American eel, Atlantic sturgeon, spiny dogfish, alewife, American shad, and American tomcod. Um, so that's kind of a cool project that's going on right now that I'm working on. And then something that I've been doing a lot in the last couple years is um, fish surveys. So we will use a uh, a vessel to do 24-hour fish surveys at our site, um, basically doing a grid pattern with an echo sounder on the vessel that's pointing downwards. Um, and the echo sounder basically just sends sound pings into the water and waits to hear reflections back from either fish or the seafloor or in trained air, whatever it is, comes back and makes a pretty picture that I'm about to show soon, um, some echo sounder data. So I worked on a lot of the fish surveys as well as the data processing um, for afterwards. And then we've also done a lot of um, deployments of echo sounders on the bottom, so facing up as opposed to facing down and stationary versus mobile. So those are some comparison projects that we're working on to kind of see what is the best way to monitor fish in our environment. Um, so this is kind of a, a little bit of a diagram of how the echo sounder data is going to look when I show it to you. It's, um, I had a hard time figuring out when I first looked at it, I was like, what is this? But um, so the echo sounder in the picture is actually from Kongsberg and it's a, it's a upward facing one in the picture. So you can see there's a little bit, there's two lines that are important um, setbacks to make sure you're getting good quality data. And there's a near field line from the face of the echo sounder and the dead zone setback from the surface. Um, at our site, uh, like I said, the Mount Everest the site is crazy, it's wild. There is a lot of entrained air because the water moves so fast, um, which is difficult for the instruments, especially the echo sounders, because the echo sounders are, um, a lot of times they're pinging off the uh, sound bladder, the air bladder of fish. Um, and they're also pinging off the entrained air in the water column. So it's very important for us to cut out the entrained air. So we're not getting, um, a, it's, we're not getting data that says we have like 1 million fish when it's really air bubbles. Um, so the, a uh, blue line there is a line that I would manually draw to edit out the entrained air. Um, and then the orange line and the orange, it, it, the um, usable water column would be between the entrained air and the near field line of the transducer. So here's an actual picture of um, some echo sander data that we collected. So you can see I would have manually drawn that pink line, which is truly terrible and takes a very long time. So anything below the pink line and above the red line would be potential um, fish or targets. So um, that would be the data that we're looking for and we're looking to exclude above the pink line. Um, so echo filter is a really cool project that um, Force worked on with DeepSense um, to try to help me not draw all those lines manually by myself. So it uses machine learning, which is so, so cool. The DeepSense people, geniuses, I don't even understand. Um, and they trained their machine learning model on my data. So all the lines that I drew the machine model, the machine learning model looked at what I did and tried to do what I do without me doing it, if that makes sense. So um, it's a really, really cool project that um, again shows like the Deep Sense team, I think they hadn't really ever worked with this kind of data before, but there's just so much collaboration in this space and so many cool interdisciplinary projects um, that really advance the industry and are just so, so cool. Um, so this is just one that I wanted to touch on and um, thank you to Jennifer for um, putting me in contact to do this presentation um, from working on this project. That's kind of how I got here. Uh, so yeah, that truly made my life a lot easier and it's just like so cool. Um, <laughs> so in conclusion, there's, the, like I've been saying the whole time, the ocean technology industry is truly so broad and it doesn't matter like if it's something you're passionate about and something that you want to pursue a career in, it 
whatever your skill set is, whatever your educational background is, there's there's probably a place for you. And um, Tidal Stream Energy specifically is just such a cool new technology that um, I think is a big growing industry and there's a lot of um, opportunities there um, and lots of opportunities here in Nova Scotia for Tidal Energy or for Ocean Tech in general. Um, so that's really, I mean, all I have, I think I might have sped through that because I am a fast talker. Um, but yeah, if there's any questions that you have, feel free to tell me now, or if you wanna um, shoot me an email, um, any questions ever, um, I'm always around. And I know that it's um, sometimes hard to think of questions on the spot. So yeah, feel free to send me an email if you come up with any ever. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Jesse. That was a great presentation. Um, thank you so much for being a part of this. We're really happy to have both you and Melanie um, in our session today. It was great from both of you. Um, does anyone have any questions for Jesse about her job or about her experience, um, what she's done in school, anything at all? Um, I'd love to hear, hear your questions. Okay, we have a question already. <laughs> when thinking about going into the environmental engineering field, what pushed you towards taking classes at NSCC? Oh, sorry, I'm trying to stop sharing my screen. Um, sorry. sorry, can you repeat the question? I was trying of to- Of course, <laughs> no problem. Um, when thinking about going into the environmental engineering field, what pushed you towards taking classes at NSCC? Oh, okay, that's actually, I mean, that might be a good question um, because that's a, that's a really good question. I personally went to NSCC uh, because I'm broke as a joke and I was really afraid of getting a big student loan and going to university. And I was it's also like, I'm never someone that knew exactly what they wanted to do, um, which has always been hard for me. I know I wanted to do something with the environment, but it, I, I honestly didn't even really know that. Like it's something I wanted, but I wasn't sure. Um, and NSCC is just so awesome. And there's so many different programs there and they're very affordable and short. Not that that's the only reason. I mean, the education I received there was really great. Um, and I'm just goes to show you don't actually, I mean, there are so many amazing, incredible PhDs and people with master's degrees that are advancing this industry and doing amazing. But like I said, there's a place for everyone. I don't have a degree. And somehow I ended up with a seat at the table. Don't know how, but um, yeah, I really just, I'm kind of impatient and I didn't want to get a degree. And then, yeah, I love NSCC. And I always knew that there was an opportunity. I think this is the main thing is if you go to NSCC and do a diploma there, there's always an opportunity to take those credits and transfer them into a university degree. If it's something that you know you want to pursue um, and you can save money that way. And you can also, you know, get different experiences that way. Um, another great thing about NSCC is the hands-on experience and the co-ops and the work terms that you get from it, which I think really give you a lot because it's, it's, it's very hard to go from a learning school environment to a real life job, even as someone that did uh, a lot of hands-on work in school and in my um, internship and co-op, like I still found it a difficult transition. So I think that NSCC is really good in that aspect. Great answer. <laughs> Does anyone else um, have any questions for, for Jesse? Reading, oh, we, that was fast. It seems like, <clears throat> so sorry. It seems like you struggled at picking your degree. What advice do you have for someone who doesn't know yet what they're going to take? I would say, and I don't know if this is good advice or bad advice, to be honest, but I, when I graduated from high school, I was very lost and I really, I, I, the thought of going to school and getting out a student loan for something that I wasn't sure about was truly terrifying to me. So I just took a gap year and uh, I did a lot of research on different programs in universities and in colleges. And I think, I really think that if you don't know what you want to do, I don't think you should go to school and, and, and put yourself in debt for if, if you are really not sure, I think I worked full time for a year and then I ended up actually working pretty much full time while I was in school, um, just to give myself an opportunity to really think about what I want my life to look like. And I think there's no rush and um, there's a lot of people that change their careers a lot in life. And I just don't think there's a rush to start something, if, especially if you're not sure about it. But at the same time, um, it's such a good learning experience to go to school and you can learn a lot about yourself and, and find out even going to school for something and finding out that's not what you want to do. I mean, that's worth it too. So I don't know, <laughs> but that's, that was my experience is I, I didn't know. So I, I took a year to, to figure it out. 
<laughs> still muted. I think that's great. I mean, uh, I think it's good advice if it if it worked for you, right? Everyone takes advice differently depending on if it if it's something that would work for them. Um, does anyone else have any questions before we wrap it up? We have a couple minutes, and then we'll uh, we'll let everyone go and enjoy the rest of their evening. Um, any questions that maybe you had forgotten to ask for Melanie as well? Now is your chance. Um, but if no one has any questions, um, you can also reach out afterwards as well. We can put you in connection if you had any specific questions for Jesse or Melanie. And of course, um, if you wanted to go back and, and watch the presentations, they will be on YouTube. Um, we'll do some editing on it and we'll throw that on YouTube tomorrow afternoon, probably. Um, and uh, without further ado, Tristan, if you want to wrap us up, I don't think we have any more questions. Awesome. Sounds good. Uh, we just wanted to thank all of you for spending an hour of your afternoon with us. It was awesome. Um, special thanks to Melanie and Jesse for joining us and just giving us kind of an inside perspective and your own kind of view and also letting us know a little more about tidal energy. Um, it also wouldn't be possible without the support of you guys and our speakers, partners, funders, all of it. So it's exciting that we get to do a uh, speaker series like this. Um, our next session is going to be this Saturday on the 20th from 1 to 3. Uh, we're joined by Supernova, so Hannah and Kira from Su Dallas Supernova. So we're learning more about marine renewable energy and then designing our own energy plan on simulated islands. Uh, there's going to be an email going out tomorrow with a list of all things that you're going to need to gather up to enjoy the little fun that we're going to have. Um, there's also going to be post-secondary mentors there, too, to help out with the design thinking process. Um, you know, give you some pointers and tricks and stuff, and also just kind of get to know them as you go along, too. Um, and then, as mentioned in the email that went out uh, this week, every session that you attend will give you an extra entry into prizes at the end of the program, which is sneaking up on us next month. Um, so, yeah, we're drawing for three iPads. So... Come hang out with us on Saturday and have some fun and possibly win an iPad. <laughs>